Okay, so now let us solve some multiple choice question to test uh, how is your learning. Question number one, GPCR requires the following proteins for signal transduction. Option A, G alpha, G beta, and G gamma proteins and GTP. Option B, G alpha and beta. Option C, RAS and KTP. Option D, GS and GI only. Now, option D is not correct because G stimulatory and G inhibitory um, proteins are tissue specifically recruited to GPCR and both proteins are not simultaneously recruited to the GPCR. Only uh, GS or GI can be recruited. So this is not the right option. Uh, number C, RAS and ATP. First of all, ATP is not required for GTP, GPCR activation. ATP is required for cyclic AMP production. And RAS is a GTPS, but it is not involved in GPCR signal transduction. Number B is G alpha and beta. G alpha and G beta is a partially correct answer because it is still requires G gamma and GTP. So option A is the right one. The trimeric G proteins, G alpha, G beta, and G gamma, as well as GTP is required for G alpha activation. So question number one, right choice is the option A. Question number two, nanobodies or fragment antigen binding aided beta 2 adrenergic receptor crystallization by option, one, option A, stabilizing ligand bound conformation, option B, activating G proteins, option C, making GPCR visible under a microscope, and option D, none of the above. Now, option C is not the right one because nanobodies bound to the GPCR still you cannot be able to see it under microscope because it is not within the microscopic resolution limit or range. Question number, option number, option B is activating G proteins. Now nanobodies do not activate G proteins. Uh, nanobodies were originally developed to stabilize a particular conformation of GPCR. Um, to facilitate crystallization. So option A is the right uh, choice here. Question number three, addition of T4 lysozyme as an N or C terminal tag to the beta 2 adrenergic receptor was performed to facilitate crystallization by option A, making the protein more hydrophobic. Now this is not the right option because uh, membrane proteins are usually hydrophobic. That means they repel water. But for crystallization, you need some uh, crystal lattice like uh, the, the protein has to be solu soluble and, uh, and, 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 uh, and the solvent has to allow uh, the protein molecules to come together and uh, organize in a crystal. So, so making a protein more hydrophobic doesn't actually help to that process. Therefore, option A is not the right one. Option B is by creating a hydrophilic interface which facilitated crystallization. Now this is the right option because adding a lysozyme to the N or C terminal has been shown to facilitate membrane bound proteins crystallization by adding a hydrophilic interface uh, which facilitates uh, formation of crystals. Question option number C by making epitope for nanobodies preparation. Now this is also not a right option because uh, First of all, epitope is the antigenic part of a protein. So it, it, it is epitopes are usually, in case of a protein, epitopes are usually a short peptide or, or of uh, six to seven amino acid. Now, of course, uh, GPCR was used as an epitope for generation of uh, camelidi antibody, which then served as a nanobody. But that was not the purpose of using nanobody in this particular crystallization process. In crystallization, nanobodies were used to stabilize a particular conformation of GPCR over other conformations. So here, the correct option is uh, option B, by creating hydrophilic interface which facilitated crystallization. Now, previously I mentioned the term ligands and I also mentioned the term stimulus. For example, physical or chemical stimulus then can activate, that can activate a G protein coupled receptor and initiate signal transduction. So the question is that ligands and the stimulus, are they used interchangeably or are they different? Uh, 
So I think now is the time to define ligands. In biochemistry and pharmacology, a ligand or an agonist is a substance that form a complex with a biomolecule to serve a biological purpose. So the biomolecule here is GPCR and the biological purpose is regulation of cell function through signal transduction. Now by this definition, most of the chemical stimulus like proteins, peptides, hormones, sugars, etc. are ligands or agonists. But it would be wise not to consider light stimulus or temperature as ligand. Previously, I also explained in great details that, uh, that ligand binding to the GPCR stabilizes a particular structural conformation which causes binding and activation of distinct signal transducer, for example, G protein coupled G proteins. But I did not mention the binding of arestins to the GPCR. Now, this is a separate pathway which uh, occurred following activation of the G protein coupled receptor and that lead to the subsequent internalization of the receptor into endosomal vesicles, which is then I, which can then follow different pathways uh, leading to the recycling of the receptor back to the membrane or, or sending the receptor to, the, to a proteasomal degradation pathway. Now, this particular signal, signaling pathway, I'll explain it in more details in the second part of my lecture. Now, I like you to concentrate on this graphical representation of different types of agonists. Now, in this graph, the x-axis represents the biological activity a measurable biological activity during signal transduction. For example, it can be a cyclic MP production or it can be change in the membrane potential due to opening of the ion gates, etc. Now, the G protein couple receptors always exhibit some degree of constitutive activity. And this constitutive activity is due to the spontaneous generation of active configuration or active state of the receptor under native unstimulated or, or unstimulated condition or in the absence of any ligand. So the constitutive activity can be defined as a receptor mediated signaling in the absence of ligand due to spontaneous population of active receptor states. So that means if there is no ligand, there is still a basal level of cyclic MP produced due to the constitutive activity of the G protein coupled receptors. So full agonist can be defined as ligands that elicit maximum signal response at the interrogated pathway. So for example, when you add acetylcholine, which is a full agonist, there is maximum production of cyclic AMP. Now by the definition, a partial agonist is ligands that elicit activity below maximum level. Now here is a term called antagonist, a neutral antagonist. Now usually antagonist does opposite to the agonist. So if an agonist increases the cyclic AMP production, the antagonist is supposed to inhibit the cyclic AMP production. Now here I have used the term neutral antagonist, which means the ligands that bind to the receptor but do not affect constitutive receptor activity. And also there is another term called inverse agonist, which is ligands that inhibit constitutive receptor activity. So these are few terms which are, which are used uh, to explain the dynamics of um, dynamics and the kinetics of the GPCR uh, agonist binding as well as uh, signal transduction. Now, I also like to point out that, the that the, some other physiological mechanisms that govern protein ligand association is not subject to this lecture and may be discussed in the other courses. For example, binding kinetics, free energy, enthalpy, entropy, or different forces and factors that drive the protein ligand binding. Those are beyond the scope of this lecture and may be dealt in other courses. Now, in this slide, I'll introduce you to three different types of ligands um, from a different perspective or definition. These are orthosteric ligands, allosteric ligands, and bitopic ligands. Um, 
Orthostatic ligands are defined as ligands that bind to the site recognized by the endogenous agonist for the receptor. For example, acetylcholine binds to a specific, a specific cleft within the receptor molecule and this is the active site in that protein. So those ligands which binds to the endogenous agonist binding site are called orthostatic ligands and this site is also called orthostatic site. Allosteric ligands are ligands that bind to a topologically distinct site and they can control the function of agonist binding to the receptor. For example, allosteric ligand can increase or decrease the signal transduction by manipulating agonist binding to the orthosteric site. So these are called allosteric ligands, which binds to the allosteric site of the protein. And the bitopic ligands are ligands that concomitantly interact with both orthosteric and allosteric sites. So this is an example of bitopic ligands, which is uh, encompassing both orthosteric site as well as allosteric site. So one thing, one take home message from this is that orthosteric site is the endogenous active site in the protein and allosteric site is a topologically distinct site on the protein where a agonist can bind and interfere with the function of the endogenous agonist. And bitopic ligand is uh, those ligands that can bind simultaneously uh, in both orthosteric and allosteric site and modulate GPCR function. So here there are some features uh, which, uh, which, which differs between uh, these three types of ligands. For example, Orthosteric ligands are usually very high affinity ligands and allosteric are not that high affinity, but bitopic ligands are also very high affinity because uh, they, are, they, are, they selectively binds both orthosteric site and allosteric site. And in terms of subtype selectivity, the orthosteric sites are not subtype specific. For example, acetylcholine receptor can bind to both muscarinic acetylcholine receptor as well as um, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And again, within the muscarinic receptor, uh, there are five different types of muscarinic acetylcholine receptor and they are termed as M1, M2, M3, M4, and M5. All of them can bind to acetylcholine. So acetylcholine doesn't have any uh, subtype selectivity in terms of recognition to a specific GPCR. On the other hand, allosteric, so allosteric ligands are very much subtype selective. That means one particular allosteric ligand can bind to M1 muscarinic receptor, but not to M2 or M3 or M4 muscarinic receptor. And the bitopic ligands are also very high and exhibit very high degree of subtype selectivity. Now, this subtype selectivity has tremendous application in drug design and uh, therapeutic treatment, which I'll discuss in the later section of this, uh, of this uh, lecture. Now, in this slide, I'll introduce to a uh, concept of allosteric modulation, a positive allosteric modulation or negative allosteric modulation. Now, this figure is showing the high resolution crystal structure of M2 muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. Now, previously, I mentioned to you that muscarinic acetylcholine receptor has five different subtypes and they are termed as M1 to M5. And these different subtypes uh, they show slightly different structural properties, but all of them are activated by acetylcholine binding. So acetylcholine is the endogenous agonist for all muscarinic acetylcholine receptor subtypes. Now in this figure, uh, there is a nanobody, activating nanobody, which is bound to the G protein site. And the orthosteric site where endogenous agonist acetylcholine binds is occupied by a orthosteric agonist, iperoxo, which is uh, shown in yellow color. And the allosteric site, which is uh, topologically present at the surface of the receptor, is occupied by another ligand, uh, allosteric ligand, which is uh, designated as LY2119620 and represented in purple color. Now, this allosteric 
ligand is termed as positive allosteric modulator that means binding of this particular ligand at the allosteric site positively influence endogenous ligand binding at the orthosteric site and subsequent signal transduction. So, what does it mean? For example, orthosteric agonist Iperoxo, when it binds to its orthosteric site, initiates cyclic EMP production due to signal transduction. But if you add positive allosteric modulator, LY211 compound along with the orthosteric agonist, then binding of these both ligands to their respective site would enhance cyclic MP production. So it will increase the cyclic MP production and that's why this effect is a positive allosteric modulation. Similarly, if it is a negative allosteric modulation, then binding of a negative allosteric modulator to the allosteric site would inhibit cyclic MP production through iperoxo binding. So this illustrates positive allosteric modulation and negative allosteric modulation, uh, but we will again face this uh, terminologies in the later part of this lecture. Now in this slide, I will explain the concept and the application of bitopic or dual allosteric ligands. Previously, I introduced you to the concept of positive allosteric modulation and negative allosteric modulation. Now, here in this figure, a G protein couple receptor is shown where the orthosteric site and allosteric sites are drawn here as two distinct sites. Now, the allosteric site is the site where allosteric ligand binds, and orthosteric site is the site where endogenous ligand binds to the GPCR and initiate signal transduction. Now binding of a allosteric ligand to the allosteric site can influence binding of endogenous ligand to the orthosteric site. So it can simply increase the affinity of the endogenous ligand or it can also decrease the affinity of endogenous ligand binding to the orthosteric site. So these two will be defined as positive allosteric modulation or negative allosteric modulation. The second modality is that a allosteric ligand can bind to its allosteric site and then increase the signal transduction following orthosteric ligand binding. And the third modality is that it can influence some other downstream signaling pathway. So there are different modalities of positive allosteric modulation and negative allosteric modulation. Now, the bitopic ligand or dual allosteric ligand, as I previously mentioned, that it simultaneously target both orthosteric site and allosteric sites. The development of bitopic ligand is based on the idea of combining high affinity via orthosteric site with high selectivity via allosteric sites, which I will explain by using these figures. Um, and Another important feature is that until now, muscarinic acetylcholine receptors have proved to be a particularly fruitful receptor model for the development and characterization of bitopic ligands. So it means that muscarinic receptor was hugely exploited for the development of uh, bitopic ligands and their therapeutic application. Now in this figure, a receptor is shown with an orthosteric site where there is an endogenous ligand is bound and that generates signal 1 uh, during signal transduction, which is uh, designated as orthosteric agonism. In this figure, an allosteric site is shown where an allosteric ligand is bound and that is affecting the activity of endogenous ligand binding to the orthosteric site, which generates a different signal, for example, signal 1 asterisk. In this example, a different allosteric site is shown. Now, for your information, the allosteric site, a protein, a GPCR can have multiple allosteric site because they are as a topologically distinct sites on the surface of the protein. So that is reflected here. That means this protein has a second allosteric site and when allosteric ligand is bound on the second allosteric site and 
uh, endogenous ligand is bound to the orthosteric side, then a completely different signal transduction happens, which is designated as signal 1 with two asterisks. In another example, when orthosteric ligand binds to, when endogenous ligand binds to the orthosteric side, it can initiate a dimerization of the protein or it can, it can bring association with another protein, a completely different membrane mount protein and that can initiate a different type of signal, for example, which is designated as signal 1 with three asterisks. So these are all examples of allosteric modulation of orthosteric agonist binding. In another example, it is shown that the same receptor, uh, allosteric ligand is shown occupying the allosteric binding site, but there is no binding of endogenous ligand to the orthosteric site and that generated a completely different type of signal, which is designated as signal 2 and that is an example of allosteric agonism. Now, in the bottom panel figure is showing different types of bitopic or dual steric ligand generation. For example, in the first figure, if an endogenous ligand is attached to a allosteric ligand and they occupy both allosteric site and orthosteric site, then the signal transduction will generate both signal 1 as well as signal 1 asterisks. In the second example, if an endogenous ligand binds to the orthosteric site and the orthosteric ligand or endogenous ligand was chemically conjugated to a uh, allosteric ligand which occupies the second allosteric site, then it will generate signal 1 as well as signal 1 with two asterisks combination during signal transduction. And in this example, if the allosteric site is present on a different protein and the dual ligand was designed by chemically conjugating native ligand with this allosteric ligand and that will bring signal 1 with three asterisks and signal 1 with no asterisks. So this combination will then happen because of this bitopic ligand binding involving two different proteins. Now these are all example of bitopic ligands binding to the orthosteric and allosteric binding sites simultaneously. So by designing this kind of synthetic drug molecules, which are combination of both orthosteric ligand and allosteric ligand, we can actually elicit different combination of downstream biological signals which are activating different biological pathways. Now I will elaborate it further in the subsequent part of this lecture or maybe the next lecture. Now this slide is a repetition of what I previously discussed about positive allosteric modulator, but here uh, there is a better diagram. Now in this diagram, the muscarinic receptor 2 structure is diagrammatically represented. It is showing the orthosteric site in green color, allosteric site in red color and the G protein binding site as a blue color. As you can see that when there is no ligand, uh, most of the receptor is present in, a, in its inactive state, but due to the constitutive basal activity, some of the active state receptor also exist, but the equilibrium is shifted more towards the inactive MQ receptor under no ligand condition. Now, when an agonist is present, it binds to the orthosteric site and binding of this agonist to the orthosteric site shifts the equilibrium more towards active M2 receptor generation. As a result, the G protein binding conformation is altered and there is recruitment of G proteins which will generate cyclic MP. But when an allosteric ligand is bound to the allosteric site and if this ligand is positive allosteric modulator, then this dynamics will be more shifted towards 
active M2 receptor and that will increase the cyclic MB production to a higher extent. So, binding of a positive allosteric modulator such as LY2119620 which is a synthetic molecule to the active state receptor M2 enhances the affinity of the receptor for the agonist and shifts the equilibrium to further favor active receptor conformations. Now this slide is showing the structural comparison of muscarinic receptors M1, M2, M3 and M4. These are the four different subtypes of muscarinic acetylcholine receptor and the agonist which is used here is called tyotropium bromide which is represented as sticks in this uh, crystal model. Now as you can see that the different transmembrane domains are shown here and they were superimposed to show their slight structural variation. Now, this structural variation in different subtypes of muscarinic receptor indicates the binding affinity of a particular agonist, uh, the selective binding affinity of a particular agonist to all these receptor subtypes. Now, in this slide, the fundamental basis of ligand selectivity and subtype specificity in GPCR is shown, shown. This picture represents the electrostatic and surface properties of four different muscarinic receptor structures, M1, M2, M3, and M4. And the negatively charged residues in the sequence alignment are colored in red. So this red colored area are surrounded by negatively charged amino acids of different transmembrane domains. And you can see that the topological feature of this cleft within the seven transmembrane regions is different in different subtypes. And that is due to the structural variation within these subtypes. And this serves as a basis for subtype specific ligand binding, particularly the allosteric ligands. As I mentioned previously that the allosteric sites are topologically distinct sites from the orthosteric site. And in this muscarinic receptor, the orthosteric site lies somewhere at the center. And the, super, and the surface, topologically surface area represents allosteric ligand binding. Now you can clearly see that the topmost surface area, surface area is distinct for each receptor. Therefore, one allosteric ligand which fits in the allosteric site here in M1 receptor may not effectively bind to the allosteric site here in M2 or M3 or M4. And this structural features and elect electrostatic surface properties defines the subtype selectivity of allosteric ligands in case of muscarinic receptors. Thus, a specific allosteric ligand which can be positive allosteric modulator or negative allosteric modulator can be designed for specific muscarinic acetylcholine receptor subtypes and that can be targeted to different parts of the central nervous system or different parts of the body wherever these receptors are expressed and the drugs can be targeted to that particular organ to treat a specific disease. So that is the application of therapeutic application of allosteric modulation uh, through by manipulation of muscarinic receptor mediated signal transduction. All right, so now I think we have discussed enough. Uh, Let's uh, solve some multiple choice question to judge your learning. Question number one, an endogenous agonist to a GPCR may bind to any of the followings. Option A, orthosteric site. Option B, allosteric site. C, G alpha binding site. And D, none of the above. So option C is not correct because if uh, agonist binds to the G alpha binding site, then that will interfere primary G protein recruitment and the signal transduction will not happen. Allosteric site is also wrong answer because that's where the allosteric uh, 
ligands binds and they exert either positive allosteric modulation or negative allosteric modulation. So the right choice here is the orthosteric site where endogenous ligands binds and causes signal transduction. Now question number two, a PAM or positive allosteric, ligand, allosteric modulator ligand, option A, negatively affect agonist binding. Option B, increase ligand binding in the allosteric site. Option C, binds to the allosteric site and increase ligand binding to the orthosteric site and D, none of the above. So positive itself indicates that it cannot be negative. So option A, negatively affect agonist binding is a wrong option. Option B, increased increase ligand binding in the allosteric site. Now, positive allosteric modulator ligand is a policy, is a allosteric ligand so it cannot increase binding in the allosteric site now option option c is it binds to the allosteric site and increase ligand binding to the orthosteric site that is a right option but again i'd like to say that there are different modalities it 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 can a pam can increase ligand binding affinity to the orthosteric site or it can also modulate signal transduction but this is the right option question number 3 a ligand binding to the active site on a gpcr has the following effect conformational change in the gpr gpcr structure which is right option b recruitment of g proteins which is also right option c activates g alpha which is also correct and option D, all of the above. So here the right answer is all of the above. Now this slide is showing a table that summarizes the properties for the G protein coupled receptors that are used for classifying GPCR in six major families. And these families are rhodopsin, secretin, adesin, glutamate, frizzled, and test 2. As you can see that uh, the number of full length receptor proteins under these six families is highest in the rhodopsin family. Number of identified major drug targets and orphan drugs are also, drugs are also highest in rhodopsin family compared to other families. And I like to mention that orphan drugs are actually named so because uh, they are intended to treat diseases so rare that uh, pharmaceutical companies are reluctant to develop them under usual marketing condition and that's why they are named as orphan drugs. Now the nature or the type of the ligand is different within different families. For example, rhodopsin family, the ligands can be peptide proteins, small organic compounds, lipid-like substances and nucleotides. Whereas in secretin, it is mostly peptides and proteins. In frizzled, it is mainly protein. And in the test 2, it is a small organic compounds which are mostly present in the food. Now, in terms of um, extended N-terminal sequence, the rhodopsin and secretin doesn't have any extended N-terminal sequence, which is usually extracellular. But most of the addition glutamate, frizzled, and test 2 receptors have very extended N-terminal sequence, which has uh, conserved function. Um, these N-terminal sequence are frequently found influence uh, allosteric or orthosteric binding of the ligand. Then another important feature is that uh, type of functional domains in the N-terminus. Now the N-terminal sequence also harbors different functional domains. Uh, it can be, it, it may have a proteolytic function or some signal protein binding function, etc. The next feature is uh, proteolytic processing of the N-termini in family members. Sometimes the N-terminus may cleave due to proteolytic activity and these clipped peptides can then have uh, some signaling function. Uh, so the G protein families differ in their proteolytic processing of the N-terminal sequence. Then conserved cysteine residues in the extracellular loop 1 and extracellular loop 2. As I mentioned previously that the transmembrane domain forms some extracellular loops in both um, uh, both uh, cytosolic site as well as um, extra uh, extracellular site and there are conserved cysteine residues which undergoes different post-translational modification which influence G GPCR function um, and they show some difference within the families and suitable as drug targets 
most of the G protein coupled receptors are suitable as drug targets except uh, test 2. One of the reason the test 2 receptors are not suitable drug targets because they are very they are very localized in the in the in the test sensitive organ uh, which is tongue um, and uh, there is not too many disease which are uh, which are of importance to the pharmaceutical companies to develop drugs for tongue related disease and uh, i think uh, there is no significant uh, there is no very important disease associated with only tongue Now this slide highlights some of the important argument that why we should study GPCR. Number one, approximately 850 members of G protein coupled receptors form the biggest human superfamily of receptors. Number two, out of this number, about 350 receptors are potentially druggable. Number three, it has been estimated that about 50% of all modern drugs act on GPCRs. Thereby documenting this class of receptors has been a successful target for the pharmaceutical industry. Number four, as of 2017, between 20 to 30 percent of FDA approved medications target GPCRs. Number five, GPCRs are good druggable target because they are more accessible to putative drug molecules, be that a small molecule or large biologicals. And Upon binding, they elicit a biological response which may be measured in vivo and in vitro. Now here, this slide is showing the current status of GPCR family structural coverage and drug targeting. Now there is a link between structural coverage and drug targeting because for designing a effective and um, successful drug, it is very important to know the structure of the G protein coupled receptor. As you can see that here are uh, different, uh, the six different families of G protein coupled receptors are mentioned here. And uh, the individual members of these families are also depicted. Also, uh, those families for whom the crystal structure is known is also mentioned here. And you can see that a large number of G protein coupled receptor crystal structure is still unknown. So there is a huge unexplored area for drug targeting and uh, crystal structure determination. Now this slide is showing GPCR, GPCR ohm white targets of approved and marketed medications. As you can see, the six families of G protein coupled receptors are shown here as a family tree. And the number of drugs targeted to addition family is 33, uh, probably to 33 different members of the addition family. Secretin 16 drugs, glutamate 22, frizzled and test 2 receptor 36. And la largest number of drugs were targeted uh, to rhodopsin family members, 719 drugs. Now, the sphere size in this figure corresponds to number of approved drugs for highlighted therapeutic GPCR targets with antagonist, agonist, and negative allosteric modulators that are shown in red, green, and blue color respectively. So as you can see that a very small number of drugs, for example, one to five are only negative allosteric modulator, but majority of the drugs are antagonist in nature, and some are um, agonist. And again, I like to highlight that a large number of antagonists were targeted to muscarinic receptor, which is a CHRM, that is the genetic symbol of muscarinic receptor. And also a large number of drugs uh, targeted to dopamine receptors, DRD2. And also a considerably large number of drugs targeted to histamine receptors. Now, these receptors uh, are targeted because of their function in regulation of important physiological function. For example, muscarinic receptors and dopamine receptors are active in uh, neuromuscular junctions and uh, also in the central and peripheral nervous system. 
Now we reached to the end of a long and exhaustive lecture, but before I finish this lecture, uh, let's solve some multiple choice uh, question to test your learning. Question number one, which of the following proteins fit the definition of GPCR? Option A, hemoglobin binds to heme and iron, which is not a GPCR. Option B, rhodopsin present in the ROT cells. Now this is a light sensitive G protein coupled receptor, so it's a correct option. Questions, option C, tubulin cytoskeletal protein, no, it is not a G protein coupled receptor, it's a cytoskeletal protein involved in microfilament formation. Option D, adrenergic receptor, a membrane protein, yes, it is a G protein coupled receptor that is uh, uh, stimulated by adrenaline hormone. So the right choice is option B and option D. Question number two, why GPCRs are suitable targets for drug development? Option A, more accessible to drug molecule. Yes, that is correct because most of the G protein coupled receptors are membrane bound, which makes them more accessible to drug molecules from the extracellular fluid or blood. Option B, upon drug binding, they elicit a biological response. That is also correct. Option C, expressed in a wide variety of tissue. This is also another correct option. And option D, so the right choice is all of the above. Question number three, in GPCR signaling, cyclic AMP is a G protein, not correct. Now, option B, second messenger, yes, that is the right option. C, a cation, and D, an anion. Now, cyclic AMP is not a cation, neither it's a cation, nor it is an anion. It's a, it's a adenosine monophosphate molecule. So, question number three, the right option is the second messenger. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, and uh, in the next lecture, I'll discuss more about the signal transduction pathway. Um, mainly focus, I'll focus on the GPCR signal transduction mediated uh, intracellular calcium release response, as well as um, the internalization of the receptor and desensitization of the receptor. So see you again in my next lecture.